we already are experiencing climate change. This is not our grandchildren. This is today, this is right now. Some of us are in aircraft carriers and some of us are in dinghies as it goes. It was very intense to live in a place where wildfires were becoming an everyday, very normal reality. Natural disasters hit nearly one in 10 American homes in 2021, leading to an estimated $56.92 billion in property damage. We're fighting systems and, and laws and policies uh, that don't quite fit the new climate reality. One of the biggest issues with climate change is that people have been living in riskier environments. Think a coastal community or a mountain house surrounded by a dry forest. Nowhere is completely safe from climate change, but there is some good news. Adaptation efforts are working, and there are some places where Americans can move to escape the worst impacts of climate disasters. There are cities that are going to fare better under climate conditions and are already. These cities, particularly around the Great Lakes, I think are considered um, to have some superior advantage. But with home prices soaring nationally, location isn't the only factor in finding a safe haven. Issues of justice and equity have to be addressed now before mass migrations start moving to haven cities. You can't just say, I'm a climate destination because I'm in Wisconsin and we're going to be fine. That's absolutely not true. You must earn it. It's not a passive title. So where can Americans go to escape climate change? And can we afford to live there? Researchers have designated some cities as climate havens or climate destinations. Unfortunately, they don't include major cities like LA, San Francisco, or where I live in Brooklyn, New York. I would define a climate destination as a location that has perhaps more manageable climate impacts. That is, there is no exposure to sea level rise. There's less risk of, of wildfires and hurricanes. They have a ready access to fresh water and they may be a legacy city, which means that they have a history of being built out for a much larger population. Mirandi also requires climate destinations to have plans to decarbonize and address affordable housing. Jesse Keenan identified a few lucky cities that meet these criteria. So in the United States, uh, a variety of different cities uh, have strengths and weaknesses in terms of their capacity to onboard climate migrants. But some of those that come to mind are Asheville, North Carolina, Knoxville, Tennessee, Toledo, Ohio, Duluth, Minnesota, Buffalo, New York, Rochester, New York, Burlington, Vermont. Keenan also sees promise in Detroit, Pittsburgh, Madison and Milwaukee, and Minneapolis. Mirandi and her research partner have added to that list Cincinnati, Ohio, Ann Arbor, Michigan, and maybe surprisingly, Orlando, Florida. You would say, oh, well, they're in Florida. They must be high risk. And yes, there are some risks. But again, like Cincinnati, Orlando is working really hard to decarbonize. And they're doing it in such a big way. They're uh, really growing their green economy. They're looking at their affordable housing. They are in quite a housing crunch right now, but they're very aware of it. They're working on it. Affordable housing is a key ingredient in all of this. About half of Americans say affordable housing is a major problem in their local community. Maggie Lawson, a chef and visual artist, moved to Cincinnati from Oakland in 2020. What made you move from Oakland to Cincinnati? <laughs> uh, many, many things, <laughs> as one might imagine, because they're very different cities and very different lifestyle. I think the first thing was just my housing was not tenable. I had roommates and I was approaching 40 and I was like, this is not the life for me. Um, I couldn't afford to buy a house. Lawson also wanted to be able to support her aging parents financially and could not do so in the competitive financial environment of Oakland. She was also concerned about the impact of wildfires on her parents' health. The smoke just descends on the city for weeks on end, and it's really unpredictable. She grew up about 45 minutes outside of Cincinnati and went to undergrad there. I didn't envision moving back. It was kind of a surprise to me when I decided to do that. That type of move is consistent with Mirandi's research. People go to where they have people. But Lawson's move is exceptional for its distance. Most people tend to make moves in their own county. The problem arises when you consider that about 30% of Americans live on a coast. 
we could expect up to 63 million people who live in the low elevation coastal zone to need to either move or uh, relocate somewhere else. So there are a lot of people at risk. Places like my community in South Louisiana are going to be taken by the sea. So people are going to have to figure out uh, what to do. Some experts like Keenan suggest moving from say Miami to Duluth check out his proposed ad campaign for the Minnesotan winter. No amount of marketing campaign is going to shape uh, the decisions that you make in the immediate aftermath of a disaster. I know I myself have been displaced uh, right now from Hurricane Ida. Uh, it's not easy, but I think we have to think in the long term and recognize that we're going to build a community for today, and that's going to be the foundation for the building of a community for tomorrow. Climate havens like Cincinnati have been investing in infrastructure to support a new wave of residents while building for a low carbon future. I see climate migration as an opportunity for these cities to avoid the mistakes of, you know, urban sprawl. They often have, you know, a vibrant, walkable downtown that might just need a little bit of revitalization. And so I live in this really progressive little neighborhood and we have a really sweet farmer's market. It's not huge, but it, people are really invested in it. So some of the farmers that I've, I'm partnering with and I'm working with in my business have stands there and I've gotten to know them through that space. Climate havens create opportunities for new and existing residents to work together. An established farmer's market like the one Lawson goes to is a great example. Big employers, also referred to as anchor institutions like hospitals or universities, can play a major role. How can we help people who are already in these cities, in the receiving zones? We don't want them to be crowded out. How can we think about jobs, the tax base? All of this is part of a broader economic development strategy, again, to think about a sustainable economy. Migration is not a problem to be dealt with. Migration is a natural way of being as humans, and it's one that we're going to have to reconsider. We don't question wealthy people who go to their summer houses around their migration patterns, but that's exactly what they're doing. My Migration is quite natural. It's only questioned based on your income level and your skin color. And this is where we have to do a lot of educating our society and our community and even shifting how we look at migration. What can local governments do? They can prepare, they can start having these conversations, they can invest in their affordable housing, they can start preparing for their own climate risks so that even if they are intaking more people, they are still prepared. This is an opportunity for us to show the best of who we are as a human society, as a nation, and as individual communities who are stepping up. It's really about building communities, and people are going to come in, and one of the things that helps bridge our society together is our ability to accommodate newcomers. This is the story of America. It's the story of immigration in America. So should we start packing now? I wouldn't urge anyone to move immediately unless they're under immediate threat, but I would say start to look at your risk. It's often a confluence of events that force people to move. After three years of really intense fire seasons, I was really clear that A, the cost of living was not manageable, and B, like being in that environment was really hard on my nervous system, and you just don't really understand the long-term impacts that like wildfires can have on your body. Lawson felt being unable to afford the life she wanted in California, coupled with the unpredictable fire season, the time had come to leave. That process has to be one rooted in autonomy. Um, of something that I've had to learn, you know, not everybody is gonna move, not everybody wants to move. Some people's identity is tied to a place and some people's life is tied to a place. If you're really relying on this house as a nest egg, your homeowner equity as part of your investment strategy, you may very well want to consider moving much sooner than later because your investment is declining. If it's in a high risk area, such as the sea level rise zone, it is declining now on an annual basis. You can look at FEMA flood maps. You can look at First Street Foundation. Maybe one day when you're bored, just like, oh, let's look at our flood risk, honey. Right? Um, <laughs> and then you can, you know, if you're informed, you can start making decisions. But not everyone can afford to move, even if they want to. There's a lot of costs that come, including the cost of um, being removed from your loved ones and from your friends, those cult that loss of social capital. But there's also benefits, and that's the benefit of being part of a new community, 
That's the benefit of rebuilding something or building something that is truly sustainable, walking away from our high carbon lifestyle into a low carbon lifestyle. When we think about people having the autonomy to move right now, we've got to understand what we're saying. We're talking about people with wealth. What keeps a lot of us up at night is that a market driven retreat will leave a ton of impoverished people behind. So there's a huge um, risk in not sort of doing this managed or planned relocation ahead of time. If cities want to do climate migration right, there are a few things they need to start thinking about now. One is, yes, where are the opportunities? A simple repurposing of land that has already been made for uh, some sort of mass development. The other thing we need to really keep in mind is what is going to happen in the long term to the residents who are already there. And this is work. This is education. Uh, this is setting up programs, not social programs that give people charity, but instead socializing and, and caring programs that give people power and connection into a new community. And third, I think we're going to have to respect culture that comes in. I mean, we have to be able to move from a place of our own power in receiving folks in power, receiving folks with dignity and receiving folks honoring their own autonomy and honoring ours and making sure that the resources that we have together, culture, water, and everything in between are ours collectively. There are lots of structural changes that residents can do to increase the life cycle of a community. For example, when I was reporting on hurricanes and sea level rise in Miami Beach, Florida, residents were elevating their homes to avoid the rising seas. And in fact, there's many infrastructure possibilities um, that we can do to, um, particularly with water and as well as extreme heat. For instance, with extreme heat, planting more trees and building more biomass to help cool and shelter us um, in the shade. But on a bigger scale, reducing our carbon emissions will help stem the flow of climate migrants. One of our best defenses against large-scale displacement is climate mitigation, which means reducing our emissions. So we cannot just continue to fill this bathtub full of water. What do we do to get people out of harm's way is we stop fossil fuel drilling. We stop the extraction. That is how we get people out of harm's way. Local municipalities can also make smart choices to make it easier for residents to lower their carbon footprints. When we're thinking about what is this community preparing for for the next 10 years or 20 years, perhaps elevating homes does the trick. Um, but when you're talking about 50 to 100 years, which is very, very difficult for communities to conceptualize, some of these fixes are, are maybe not the best idea. They may give that false impression of security. But I think now is the time for greater engagement in democratic processes um, to hold and really participate, not just hold leaders accountable, but participate in the process of envisioning what you want your city to look like.